So we're back from a break. Remember you found the coffee and the snacks you're looking for? We've got Jim Dude, Dude Dixon. Um, the, uh, I know that he was kind of mentioned yesterday, but uh, all of us really owe him a huge debt of gratitude for the initial work he did. Um, the hardware interfaces he designed became the foundation for what made Asterisk functional and, and possible. Um, and of course, now here we are, uh, 10, 15 years later, with an entire conference dedicated to it. Um, so that, that's pretty remarkable. But anyway, Jim, thank you, and uh, take away. Thank you. Long time ago, the phone system obviously was very different. We had the phone company. Of course, the phone company was different, you know, depending upon where you were, depending upon, um, you know, what country you were in, et cetera, et cetera. But everybody, no matter where they were, had something that you could call the phone company. It may have been a cluster of businesses. It may have been one. It may have been the, a governmental entity. It may have been a lot of things. But there was something called the phone company. and. The phone company was never liked by anybody. You know, it doesn't matter who it was again, but um, it was expensive, it was proprietary, it was closed, and they knew that they had you where they wanted you. And they really took a lot of really unfair advantage of that. Every, every one of them did. And, you know, it was really time for that to change. And, um, for that reason and many other reasons, um, I started, you know, I, I didn't like them. Nobody liked them. I mean, there, there, there was certainly no question that it was one of the least liked organizations that anybody ever had to deal with at the time. And, um, you know, I really wanted to find some way of, of making that better. So I was, you know, I've, I've been dealing with, um, your computers and telephony for, for, for a very, very long time. Um, you know, I was uh, an implementer of very many computer telephony platforms and a number of other things for many years, you know, long before Asterisk, long before, you know, the open source happened with telephony. And um, it was, it was time that something changed. Um, I realized that because of the fact that I have a good background in, in, in telephony and a good background in, in, in computers and, and, and networking and communications in general, um, I realized that with the way things were going, I mean, basically, Moore's Law, uh, Dr. Gordon Moore, um, you know, he was uh, one of the founders of Intel. He was one of the, you know, big, very, very early people in integrated circuits and microprocessors. He noticed a long time ago in the 70s that as time went on, um, basically computer power doubled every 18 months. And I'm not sure if he ever really understood why that was, but he, he recognized that that was the case, and it became what's called Moore's Law. And consistently, as far as I know, that's been the case ever since. So, you know, if you can rely on that, you can see that at some point, computers would be able to in software, in other words, a standard, like, like a PC, for example, a standard you know, commodity type of computer, would be powerful enough eventually to be able to do telephony switching functions, mostly in software with very minimal hardware required, and therefore bringing the complexity and the cost of telephony and, and implementation of telephony down quite considerably from where it was. Because at the time, it was you know, big systems, expensive systems, and mostly magic. I mean, most people didn't even know what they did, really, or, or how they worked, or anything. And, you know, the people who were making them wasn't, weren't really about to tell anybody, because, you know, that was their cash cow. The, the, you know, everything was just so incredibly ridiculously priced for, for really no good reason. So, I was really familiar with what it took to make all this happen, as far as, you know, what a phone switch was, what it would do, etc., and um, I was, um, you know, basically trying to project based on computer complexity and, and computer uh, the ability of computers about the time and you know what architecture basically would have enough power, enough ability to be able to accomplish this, and it was 
you know, getting right around, right around the, uh, the the turn of the the turn of the century, the change of the millennium, whatever you want to call it, right, right around 2000. You know, the Pentium 3 had come out. Um, it looked really about like it was time to me. So to me, what I figured was certainly I'd be see people doing this because I mean I figured that I wasn't the only person on the planet that probably could see this happen and. You know, could, could see that this was going to happen, and, and uh, I, I really just uh, started looking around. You know, I, I, I started searching uh, all over because I figured I'd see this happen. And I was searching for maybe a year and a half or so as, as the Pentium 3 first came out, and you know, then faster ones, uh, you know, started with, I guess with the 450, and then they, they got faster and faster, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, um, no one was, it was not on anybody's radar. Nobody knew this. So I figured, well, uh, you know, somebody needs to do this. I guess it needs to be me. So uh, that's basically what I did. Um, you know, I knew what it took. I knew what hardware it took. And um, I did some initial testing and some development just to see if, you know, my, my crazy harebrained idea had any, had any valor. And it certainly did. So I went ahead and I you know, designed a, a card that uh, was capable of doing two either T1 or E1 interfaces on what, what, what at that time was the ISA bus, the ISA bus for a, for, a, for like you know PC compatible computer, and um, and I came out with it and I, I released it to the world for free. Um, the, the the design of the card I included all of the the, the PC board CAD information so literally um, anybody could just download this package, go to a PC board house, have these cards made, build them, whatever, completely for free. To the, to the Basically, it was open source hardware. I don't know if anybody had really done that before. I, I don't really think so, certainly not. You know, the, there's, obviously, there's experimenters that have been you know, exchanging electrical circuits for, for, for years and years and years, long before that. But as far as like a, a really major um, you know, hardware, you know, a piece of intellectual property like that. I don't know if anybody ever done that open source uh, with, with hardware before. So um, I, I knew, you know, I, I've implemented to, I've, I've implemented, you know, TDM switches before. I, I, I've, I've, I've designed them. I've, I've built them. I've made them work. And I know how much of a project it was. I know, I know how complex it is. And to do what I really wanted to do here, that was too big of a piece of piece for me to bite off. So. I basically bit off a chunk that was about the right size, and that was, you know, the the, the basically the system, uh, the system design, uh, an initial piece of hardware that worked with it, drivers, um, and a library, user space, and some example programs that showed that this thing, you know, really does take calls, it really does work, and it even included um, the ability to do, you know, multi-port conferencing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You know, and it was all in the driver, and uh, you know, it was all at the time it was under FreeBSD. You know, that was my operating system of choice. You know, don't hate me for that. <laughs> I know everybody here probably likes Linux, but, uh, and, I, and I do too now. But um, back then, FreeBSD was my thing. So I released the whole thing, and for about two weeks, I kept getting questions like, uh, "When are you going to do this for Linux?" It just kept, kept happening over and over and over again. And so I figured the handwriting was on the wall. It needed to happen with Linux. I'd never really run Linux before. I'd seen other people do it a few years before that. It wasn't, it, it hadn't really reached sufficient maturity when I had seen it to really be able to, you know, be able to use it reliably. I'd seen people, you know, removing a lot of hair in server rooms because the thing just wouldn't take a load. Now, now bear in mind, this was, you know, in the 90s, and, and, and Linux was pretty young at the time. And by the time I was doing this, it had matured sufficiently to be stable, but I wasn't aware of it because it really wasn't my thing. Anyway, so I went out and I bought a copy of Red Hat Linux off the shelf, you know, back in the good old days when you could buy software in a box, and, uh, and took a look at an ISA driver. I just wanted to see what a Linux ISA driver looked like. And it looked surprisingly an awful lot like drivers for the other Unixes that I'd implemented. I'd done a number of things on FreeBSD, including obviously the telephony thing recently. I'd written drivers for traditional Unix for quite a long time. So I figured, well, why not? Let's try to port the thing. So that night, 
I was successfully able to port the driver over to, to, to Linux. And the user space stuff, with, with one exception, with one line, of, with one include, in one include statement I had, compiled just out of the box. That was pretty amazing. I was impressed with that. So um, I actually got it to work that night. So I released it, um, and I figured that, you know, Linux people, obviously, but from what I've seen, you know, there are Linux ways of doing things, just like there's FreeBSD ways of doing things, just like any other operating system. There's certain standards, there's certain ways of doing things, formatting things, and I knew I knew none of them for Linux. So I knew that some Linux person would see it and say, hmm, this is interesting, but wow, it's just really, you know, in the wrong format, and it's wrong, and um, let me fix it for you. Well, I woke up the next morning and got exactly that email. And at the bottom of the email, it said, by the way, there's something interesting I want to talk to you. Please let me call you. That was from Mark Spencer. That's how I met Mark Spencer. And um, so, yes, he fixed my driver and made it all nice and Linux and happy. And he talked to me about asterisk. And I said, wow, this was really meant to happen. This is, this is just the, the, the perfect marriage. And uh, that's how asterisk got started. You know, that's, how the, that's how the whole thing really happened. And um, you know, we got together, and um, we uh, you know took what he had at the time, and we you know glued it together, and um, you know made some changes in the driver, and you know it, it developed over time, and we actually got you know a real phone switch working, and that's the phone switch that I have here today um, at the uh, at the booth. Um, I'm sure you've probably all seen it, and um, we've uh, you know. It, it's improved a little bit since then, obviously. <laughs> um, but that's basically the um, that's basically what happened. Um, you know, um, it, it's weird how every once in a while, you know, you, you come across things that were just sort of meant to happen. It's, it, I, I, it, I always got the impression this was just kind of one of them. You know, we just sort of found each other, and that the two the two parts so work well, so work so well together. So, you know, I sort of brought not only that, not only, you know, the system design and the hardware and the, the ability for Asterisk to actually, you know, talk to, you know, existing, existing interfaces, existing equipment, and actually be part of the PSTN, because it was my intention from the very beginning that all of this was really supposed to replace the PSTN to, to you know, be you know, the fundamental implementation of what was to become the PSTN, because it really needed to get out of the hands of the phone company. It really needed to get in the hands of the people. And that was really my intention there. So, you know, I brought, uh, I brought you know, my knowledge of what a, a PSTN switch needed to do, you know, both from a, you know, both from a, a, a switch that, uh, what's called a class 5 switch that, uh, you know, had a subscriber lines and a, what's called a class 4 switch that's basically a tandem. And, um, we implemented that in Asterisk, and uh, that's how it got to be. That's how it got started. That's how it got to be uh, uh, to the point where it was useful, and and and, uh, and people that were familiar with the with the with the with telephony were able to see it and go, "Wow, this thing really is a real switch. It really does have all these features, and they really do work." And um, you know, the 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 rest. You know, the rest, uh, you, you've all, you, you've all, everybody that's been involved with this has really uh, done an awful lot to really help make Asterisk what it's become. You know, it wasn't just one person, it wasn't just two people, it wasn't just ten people, it's been an awful lot of people. It's not, it's, it's been, you know, all of the users, you know, helping, giving feedback, contributing many, many amazing things to, to the whole project. And, you know, it, it really has been a wonderful group effort. And I'm really happy to be part of that. And um, it's uh, it's really it's really changed things for the best. And um, I'm, I'm really, like I said, I'm really happy to be part of that. So, um, are there any questions at this point? Please. Yeah, I do. So, uh, yeah, dude. Um, so, I gather that. Some of the very original Digium cuts were based on your own designs. Can you tell us a little bit about um, how you saw the kind of growth curve 
that Digim experience and, and uh, how you might have been involved in that? Well, yeah, the, the, original, the original card that Digium sold was the original PCI card. You know, basically, the, the first card that I originally designed was, was an ISA card. And when you know, it was demonstrated that it was you know, useful and applicable and you know, we had a, you know, a, a switch that worked, etc., I went ahead and designed a PCI card because obviously the ISA bus was dead pretty much at the time. You know, there were only a couple of motherboards, at least new motherboards, that you could buy that even supported it. I did, I did my original design with ISA because it was, a, it was a, a really easy way of getting into it and proving that it worked because the ISA bus was reasonably easy to design for compared with the PCI. But of course, to, to be really useful to anyone, it really needed to be a PCI bus because like I said, the ISA, the ISA bus was pretty much dead. So I designed what became the, the Tormenta 2 card. Um, and I released that to the, again to the world, uh, you know, completely free. And um, you know, Digium started selling those cards. You know, basically, you know, using that exact design that I had made and selling the cards. And um, you know, they, they've I mean, obviously there's a number of things that Digium has done since. You know, they started making their own cards, um, started um, you know selling and producing a number of other products and a number of other services and things. Um, and um, you know, it, it seemed pretty obvious that you know once the first card was sold, you know, it would be it would show that the business was viable, which of course obviously it was. It would it would it would, it would uh, you know, provide some revenue, you know, for, for some more development, and which of course it did. And um, you know, things just sort of moved onward and upward from there. You know, the new 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 cards came out, new software came out things that were better, things that were denser, things that, that did a lot more. And um, that just it was kind of the natural logical progression of it. Long time listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> Jim, did you uh, patent any of your cards or is that counterintuitive in the open source arena? No, no, it was, uh, in fact, I actually um, paid an attorney to um, produce some wording so that it was there was no possible way anybody could do anything other than have it as, as open source and public domain. Um, you know, the, the whole idea here is that, you know, if, if you really want to make a revolution, you have to be revolutionary. And, you know, it, um, there's no way, you know, when you, when you have something patented, there's, there's, there's a means of controlling it. And this needed to not have control. And that was very important. And then I made sure that that was the case. What's well, the question? No other questions? As one of the initial members of the Asterix family, where do you see Asterix going ahead in the next five to ten years? What? No, I don't know. I mean, it, it's 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 you know certainly been on a fairly consistent path, um, you know, onwards and upwards. You know, things are you know like I said, things are getting more efficient, things are improving, people are coming up with you know, constantly with. New and improved things that can they can do, um, you know. It, it's what it really is. Is it's a kind of a, a way for people to. It's kind of a platform for people to be able to sort of uh, envision things, make them happy, or make them happen, and um, give people ability to really sort of implement their vision. You know, that's what you know. We, we had a vision to create this thing. And so many people have had so many visions of what they want. Have you know, been, been good at supporting people and, and their needs? And uh, that's going to continue. So you know, in, in any sort of a thing like this, there's sort of a natural process where the people that are you know implementing and designing the thing you know, react to the needs and the and the, and the and the interests of the users, and that just makes the whole thing grow and become a lot richer. And that's what's going to continue to do. Dude, I have another question. So, 
I understand what you're saying about being revolutionary and, and the um, thing that you created, not having any control over it. Mm -hmm. How do you uh, see that up against the situation that it was those cars that generated a lot of revenue that allowed Digium to invest in furthering Asterisk? And of course, because it's so free, there's people in various regions producing uh, lots of other cards that are not Digium cards, and when those are purchased, they're not contributing to the ongoing work of Asterisk. Well, it is though, because you know Asterisk is still being used by those people, and you know, do you? I believe Digium's project is a product is amazing. Do you? I think you do too. I certainly do. Of course you do, and you know. Maybe I'm dumb, maybe I'm stupid, maybe I'm insane, but I believe that someone's technology and someone's project product should speak for itself. It shouldn't have to be advertised, it shouldn't have to be, in other words, people should come to Digium because the product, the product is amazing, and, and I think they do. Thank you. What was the birth date of that first Avenger car, do you remember? Um, are you talking about the actual production yeah. Torment Isaac card. Can you read the question, please? Oh, he was asking about the birth date of the original card. Um, the original production Torment card was in 2001. <coughs> the design was being done in the very late part of 2000. But I believe the actual, the Rev A production card, I think, was like January or February of 2001. And then the, the PCI card was uh, uh, pretty much 2002, early part of 2002. So I have a question. Sure. Has the revolution uh, met your uh, aspirations, and did it more or less go the way you hoped, thought it would go? Yeah, in fact, I think it sort of exceeded them, to be honest with you. You know, I was, uh, there, there were two things that I really wanted to accomplish with this. One was um, computer telephony was proprietary, broken, and overpriced. That stopped. You know, all of those things stopped with it. Um, there was other phone equipment, other phone equipment manufacturers that, again, were, you know, it was large, it was overpriced, it was attitudinal. That all went away. I'm glad to see that. Um, I was sort of hoping that we, that we, you know, sort of help convince, you know, the phone company not to be so evil anymore. I think we pretty much killed them. <laughs> Oops. Oops. <laughs> I hate when that happens. <laughs> uh, sure. So uh, there's certain things that you predicted and that you said you expected to happen and they did. What happened that you didn't expect or that you didn't predict? Wow. Wow. Um, there's some really, there were some really big hardware manufacturers that we just took out that I wasn't expecting to happen. I won't mention them, but uh, you all know who they are. And that, I really didn't expect that to happen, but it did. Any other questions? How are we doing that time? I'm not, I didn't, I was. Yeah, you're good, you go. Okay. Uh, totally another topic, but kind okay. of, sort of, but uh, what's your opinion on net neutrality? I'm sorry? Net neutrality? Well, are you talking about um, whether it's right or wrong, or whether it's happening or not, or, or what, what part of that? Uh, big topic. Big topic, just because I can see that being one of the biggest issues now going forward that could have issues uh, affecting Indeed. innovation and the ability for people just to do what they want to do is running into net neutrality. And if you don't pay, you're not going to be able to put your product out there. Yeah, I understand that. And I, the, every time I hear people, you know, moaning about that whole thing about uh, you know about you know the the, the the different companies trying to trying to uh, get out of the, the, the whole neutral and fair game, um, it sort of concerns me. But my hopes is that, you know, if that whole thing becomes evil, we'll just 
You know, you, you can have you can have many networks, can't you? You know, that doesn't. You know, it's it's kind of like, and I think that's one of the things that's stopping it. Which is, you know, if we if, if there needs to if there needs to be an evil net, fine, we can make an unevil net. No problem. Uh, I think you have envisioned a hardware revolution, and uh, just now David was talking about you know other others manufacturing the cards and not contributing to the Asterix uh, stream. I mean, how was the the vision of your hardware revolution? Is it uh, the way David has pictured, or everybody manufacturing? Yeah. Well, I was interested in getting the equipment and the technology into the hands of everyone. And that's what's happened. And that's very important. Um, again, maybe I'm just stupid or naive or, or whatever. I'm really not a business dude. But, you know, I, I've, I've always, you know, and maybe I'm just a stupid idealist. But I'm a, again, I'm a firm believer that a product should speak for itself. And as far as I can tell, as far as I can see, you know, it, it's done very well. Yeah. So, uh, with, with such a fierce track record of uh, spotting something that needed to change and being involved in the change, do you ever look around, dude, and see other things that are ripe for change? Plenty. <laughs> Care to name a couple? I'm sorry? Do you care to name a couple? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what, let, let's do it historically. So, between when you did the Zapata revolution and now, have you seen anything along the way that you thought, that needs to change, and then somebody's changed it, and you kind of smiled to yourself that you, that you uh, concurred? I would imagine so. I, I mean, if, if you're going to ask me to name them at this moment, um, uh, you know, I'd probably have to think about it probably longer than the scope of this discussion. But yeah, I, I'm sure there has been quite a few, actually. Okay, thank you. Um, so in the scope of the revolution, did you ever find yourself getting pushback from some of the big manufacturers, you know, some of the, the big uh, PDX providers, you know, seeing where, where this is going, see where it's going, and trying to buy you out, or trying to, you know, re-steer the direction of, of the way this is going? Well, I, 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 I really tried my best to try to make it painfully obvious that that wasn't an option, so no one would even bother trying, because it's not. Are you talking about the actual first actual phone call as a user? I mean, you know, there's, there's a lot. It, it, it's like, uh, it's, you know, I, I do a lot of uh, two-way radio stuff, um, you know, obviously with Asterisk. I, I, I do a lot of other things. And, you know, th there's a lot of, you know, traffic. There's a lot of communications traffic, which isn't real communications traffic. It's just testing. You know, I, I don't know if I've actually talked on the radio much in, in 10 years, but, you know, there's an awful lot of, you know, squeezing the microphone and going, <laughs> hello, hello, <laughs> making sure it's working. There was an awful lot of that, but um, probably one of the very first, I mean, certainly one of the very first calls that ever, that ever happened um, was, you know, one, once it was you know, proven that the thing was working and stuff, you know, basically what happened is we got mine working and stuff, and it was, you know, I, I mean, you know, it was, it was running for a couple of days, and then Mark set one up in, in Huntsville, you know, of course, at Linux support services, of course, at the time, so before Digium. And, um, you know, we were, most of the traffic was going between us, to be honest with you. The first call, did, did any of that come into play, or was it just kind of an well, No, no, no. I, I, I mean, obviously, I, I understood the potential of this whole thing from the very beginning. I mean, that's why the whole, you know, you know, uh, you know General Zapata and the whole, you know, revolutionary aspect, because my, my, fully in, my full intent and full knowledge from the beginning was to create a revolution. Um, and I, I'm glad I was successful, but um, 
other than that, I mean, the, the little details and stuff, I, I think I was too busy making it happen. Was, was there a Watson come here kind of first phrase? No, I didn't spill any acid in my lap. <laughs> but it was probably, but if there was one, it was probably, dude. <laughs> All right, any other questions? All right, dude, thank you very much. Thank you. Please don't forget to fill out. We have a speaker.